Hello uh, everybody, good to see you all, a uh, few familiar faces. Uh, I believe this is my ninth AUC event, and I think it's been about five years since I presented at DevWorld, so it's, uh, it's good to be back. Um, if you've attended any of my talks over the last few years, uh, you have seen me give talks about uh, just discipline crossovers with iOS, um, things like uh, banking apps, um, social networks, 3D animation, and also augmented reality. Um, I'm really into um, well, building beautiful software these days, hence I'm here with Zero. And I've seen a lot of code bases over time. Some of them have been really good, some of them have been really shit. Um, part of my journey as a developer has been about learning why some of these decisions and these code bases were made, um, how I could learn from them, and um, whether I could end up building uh, solutions that could really stand the tests of time. Now, my career seems to have kind of gravitated towards this architecture pattern called Viper. Uh, I can't get enough of it. I just keep talking about it. I even gave a talk recently at Zero about whether we could potentially use Viper. And today, it's your turn to hear all about it. So if you haven't heard about Viper yet, it is a software architecture pattern. It's the backbone of your code base. Uh, it's the blueprint of, for building components within your app. Uh, it builds on the limitations of other architectures out there, so we're going to kind of have to go over those a little bit. So I'll give you a quick recap of what's currently available for iOS developers to use. We'll then look at its structure. Uh, we're going to cover the main components and how they kind of slot together cohesively. I'll go over some of the known pros and cons of Viper, and I'll list a few real-world examples of how it's been used in the industry, so you can get a bit of a feel about how people are molding it into a way that they think is right. I've implemented Viper in about five major code bases so far, and those applications are currently on the App Store. Uh, I've prototyped a lot of its concepts in my spare time. So Viper these days is my kind of go-to architecture harness. There's a number of um, tips and tricks that I've kind of adopted through my playing around with Viper over the years, and I'm hoping to kind of impart them to you as a parting gift. I'm going to keep this talk, well, ideally within the time frame. Initially, it was an hour and a half talk at zero, so I've had to aggressively cut slides out, even about an hour ago. So if I go near overtime, sorry about that, but I'm always open for asking questions after. Um, I've got about 10 slides to go through, so I'm not going to bombard you with too many of those. So we'll kind of hang around on a few so you get a good idea of what the architecture looks like and get your head around the diagram. Um, there's been a few sessions at DevVault already about architecture, so um, if you've missed any of those, don't worry, I'll give you a good recap about it. So when you start out as an iOS developer, your first objectives are to figure out what the hell is going on, and then to solve very specific tasks. Apple sample code will kind of guide you towards some solutions for very specific, particular issues, um, but that kind of doesn't really come with how that particular issue will slot into the overall greater picture one day. We get given view controllers kind of out of the box, and that's the way that we encapsulate our code in iOS apps. Um, aside from that, you're pretty much on your own. Uh, so as your projects continue to grow and you involve other people, eventually there's like a real screaming need for a good architecture. So as an iOS developer, what are really your choices? Well, ultimately, the iOS ecosystem kind of dictates what we can and can't get away with. Um, anybody recognize this architecture pattern over here? Looks kind of familiar. Yeah, you think it does, but it's not what you've been using. Um, this is the one that's kind of prescribed in the documentation by Apple. Uh, it's nice, it's symmetric, it's pretty simple. It's only got like three things going on there. Um, how about we'll just focus on those little blocks for a bit. Uh, I've got a model. Uh, that's more like a loose term, really. It's the, the, the data access layer, effectively. It is it's the thing of your app that manipulates the data. So in zero terms, because we're doing accounting, we're talking about things like uh, bills and like a bill provider class. That, that's that side of the app. Uh, we've also got views. I mean, we go crazy with views in iOS. Uh, these are responsible for the presentation layer or the GUI side of things. So you can consider anything starting with a UI prefix, so that's labels and text fields and what have you not uh, as part of that layer. Um, they're usually encapsulated by some sort of a parent UI view as well. And we've also got this controller thing that sits in the middle. And that's like the, the glue or the mediator that tries to coordinate between the view and the model. Uh, in general, it's responsible for altering the model by reacting to the user's actions performed on the view and then updating the view as a consequence of changes in the model. 
Now, these elements are divided for a reason, right? Like, we, we want to group these things. Uh, it allows us to understand them and to reuse them and to test them. Well, in, in theory, anyway. Uh, the controller isn't particularly reusable, you know, because it's pretty much, you know, doing all the tricky coordination between the view and the model. And that code kind of has to live in the controller because it can't really live in either of the other two. So unfortunately in iOS, that MVC pattern doesn't quite operate in this way. So this should probably look a lot more familiar, right? So this is really kind of crammed down there. Um, this is classically known as the massive view controller pattern that we kind of get plagued with in iOS development. In reality, the view controller is so closely tied to the life cycle of the view, they are effectively considered the same object. And I found this is kind of one of those really crucial bits of information to get your head around when you do iOS development because it really dictates some of the decisions that we're going to be able to make um, when we are developing in iOS. You can attempt to move some of this, um, yeah. You can tend to move some of the logic that kind of sits in that um, view controller into maybe the model area, because there might be some things that are particularly tied to the model layer that you can kind of get away with by pushing that direction. But things like uh, anything that's view-based, the controller is always going to have to take responsibility for it. The view has to kind of you know, relay those messages saying, oh, something has happened, you're going to have to deal with it, and oh, you, I select another thing, deal with it. That view controller is completely responsible for that view. But there's all sorts of other things going on in our app. You know, we've got like a core location, uh, we've got like a network layer, we've got all sorts of other different services that somebody has to be responsible for, as well as responding to the model. So that view controller just keeps growing. It's a massive view controller, and it's a massive problem. Because from a testing perspective, like this architecture is really bad, right? You have a view and a control that are so close together that you can't split them apart, you can't test them individually, really. So you pretty much don't bother with it. Um, you ultimately just end up testing the model. And from an architecture complexity perspective, ironically, this is actually the, the simplest one that you can get started with. So Apple says, hey, here's an architecture you can start with. It's great, but ultimately you create a really big mess for yourself. So it, it, it doesn't really do what we would like it to do. So hence, there's the model view presenter pattern, which recognizes the close coupling of the view and the view controller, and considers them to be um, a single component of the architecture. You notice how this diagram actually looks quite similar to the original MVC diagram that I showed you. Uh, it introduces an intermediary object called the presenter, which provides like a new home for some of the complex presentation logic that the controller was previously concerned with. Uh, the presenter knows nothing about the view lifecycle or the layout code for that matter. And as far as it's aware, it has no idea that it actually is a view that it's talking to. Now, uh, the view can actually be implemented in any sort of uh, paradigm. Like, let's say it's a UI kit, but it could also be app kit. It could also be an status item. So the components are super separated. We now have to kind of communicate uh, across, like, interface between classes. For example, if you press a button in the view to add, like, a reference field to a form or something, uh, that instruction has to be sent to the presenter. Uh, and then the presenter makes that change happen in some form. And as a consequence, the presenter will then notify the view saying, oh, some content has changed, you need to now redisplay yourself. So there's like an extra channel of communication going on back and forth. Um, this communication between the view and the presenter is considered like a, a manual and explicit form of uh, data and event binding. I say something happens, I have to tell you about it. Something has happened as a consequence, I have to tell you back about it. There's a variation of the MVP pattern called the supervising controller MVP pattern. Uh, this allows data binding to occur uh, between the view and the model, and the presenter kind of acts as some sort of an intermediary facilitating object. So then you can get a kind of binding paradigm that you normally get in the model view view model um, uh, architecture. Uh, the problem with that is it means that you've got your responsibility kind of shared all over the place. Like the presenter is kind of helping, but not really, and your view is kind of talking directly to the model, which is also a bit gross. So that's definitely not the right direction to go with MVP. Uh, that said, you'll typically find that sort of architecture in macOS applications. From a testing perspective, this MVP architecture uh, is a step in the right direction. Testability is greatly improved as the presentation logic um, now lives within the presenter. We can cover it in unit tests uh, without needing to awkwardly present and uh, inspect view controllers. Uh, the view component is also super passive, so it's uh, nicely simple, only concerned with UI, specific, UI kit specific, so you don't have to worry so much about, um, I mean, you still have to cover it in tests with UI tests, but all that logic has been moved into a level where you can test it with unit tests. 
Um, the logic for preparing the data to present, however, still has to live in the presenter. I mean, the presenter has to get everything ready for the view. And if we are moving things out of the view controller into the presenter, we still have a bit of a problem that we're going to have a massive presenter ultimately. So that is one issue with the presenter pattern is that that thing's just gross. The other thing is now that we've got some sort of an object sitting here, who's responsible for kind of connecting all these components together? Who's responsible for yeah building up the stack uh, and injecting everything the way that it should be? Um, we'll cover this issue a little bit later on. So I alluded before to the model view view model pattern, and so this is another flavor that's currently in practice. It's also very similar to uh, MVP. Uh, there is no tight coupling between the view and the model either, but it introduces a binding pattern that's um, pretty similar to the supervising MVP variety, except rather than binding directly between the view and the model, the view binds to the view model. The view model basically uh, reflects the current state of what's going on in the app, and something might happen, so the view says, all right, uh, an action has taken place, the view model knows to do something, talks to the model, eventually a change happened, but because a binding has been set up, the view is automatically updated with changes, so it always remains in sync. Um, so the binding is uh, a nice improvement from a functional perspective, but in effect, you've still got similar problems. Uh, similarly, it struggles from the fact that the view model now carries all the responsibility that the view controller did, minus just the very specific um, UI stuff. Uh, the other thing is it also suffers from the fact that how are you going to assemble the structure, well, the assembly problem. Testing, similar to MVP, is improved because uh, the view is properly separated from the model. Uh, but the architecture still suffers, yeah, like I said, the same things that MVP has. The view model is wearing a lot of hats. It's not apparent who's responsible for assembling and presenting other modules in that application. So, hence, Viper exists. Uh, when people ask me what Viper is, I prefer the analogy, it's MVP, but on steroids. Viper extends MVP by recognizing uh, and formalizing several components of the clean architecture. Um, I mean, it looks pretty similar to MVP. Uh, you've got a, a view and a presenter to start, but the, the model layer seems, well, kind of spread between the interactor and the entity, and what's this kind of random router that's floating at the top? All these components are considered individual units. They collectively make up one module. A good rule of thumb is that a, a single screen in the app is equivalent to one stack of a view, an interactor, a presenter, a router, and some entities. Each component has an input and an output interface that describe what instructions it can send and receive. They talk to each other through these interfaces in a particular flow, and we can probably figure out what the flow is by starting with the view and just work our way through the diagram. You get a good feel about the communication that goes on. So the view component is more of the same compared to MVP. Uh, it's, in, it's very simple. Um, it's a passive object. It's tied to a, a UI-specific implementation. And the view and view controller are definitely considered the same entity. Whenever something happens in the view, like selecting a row on the table, or tapping over a button, or any action that's invoked by the user, it tells the presenter about it. The view only concerns itself with UI logic. So uh, a lot of this relationship uh, is the view just telling the presenter something happened and the presenter acting accordingly and telling it something in response. The communication is typically uh, synchronous in nature. I tell you something, you tell me something immediately straight back. The presenter component is a little different in Viper. Its responsibility is now far more formalized. It only really engages in logic that relates to presentation. When a view notifies the presenter, uh, that something has happened. The presenter uh, puts on its little thinking cap on behalf of the view. It consults its current state and figures out um, what needs to happen. We might need to tell the view that we should be um, updated in some way, like uh, the title, and ideally that would be a localized title. Uh, we might need to show a, a loader of sorts, uh, eventually put it away, and the presenter will decide uh, what needs to be presented, and the view decides how it does it. So if the view needs to display content, it's up to the presenter to prepare that content in a format that's abstracted, um, abstracted from implementation so that the view can decide how to display it. A typical example is a, a form that's back with a table view. If the design department says tomorrow, hey, you know, table views are out, we're going to do everything with collection views from now on, you should be able to refactor that view without ever touching anything else in the hierarchy. So the presenter knows what we're going to present, but how does it, know, uh, how does it make that decision? Viper makes a really clear distinction between what is presentation logic and what is business logic. The interactor exists to deal with how we uh, manipulate data in the app to match the use cases or business logic of our application. For example, 
a use case might be um, a user should be able to view a list of recent invoices. The presenter knows that it wants to show them. So when it's time for presenting, it can ask the interactor, hey, can you please get me a list of invoices all sorted in the right order that I expect? The interactor then has to go out and retrieve and process and, um, and sort them. Now, these invoices can be anywhere. Um, I mean, they can be on the web, they can be in storage, loaded from disk, abstracted into some ridiculous thing that you built once. Um, the presenter doesn't need to know about that. It just asks the interactor to retrieve something, tells the view to show a loader, and eventually when the interactor has done, it goes, all right, I've got all the information that I need. Um, or the interactor might say, uh, sorry, something went wrong, whoopsie. Uh, it's down to the presenter to go, all right, well, uh, if I had some information, I'd probably do this, but if I've got an error, then I could probably transform that away and show that instead, and notify the view that an error needs to be shown. Um, the relationship in that communication between the presenter and the interactor is typically asynchronous because the interactor has to go out and do a couple of things and it might stitch a whole bunch of operations together. Now you can tell that there's a lot of communication going on in Viper, right? The viewer talks to the presenter, the presenter talks to the interactor, eventually that whole conversation chain goes right back again. Um, the interactor has to go fetch information and kind of package it up in some form and then give it back to the presenter and then the presenter also has to kind of transform that information for the view. Now the interactor is communicating with this entity component down below. And that conversation is about asking it for um, entities and having to retrieve them and process them. The classic definition of Viper stipulates that the entity component governs the management of entities in the app, which would be synonymous to maybe the, the model component in our classic MVC architecture that we're used to. Uh, a customer repository could be one of those things and you could ask it to fetch and return some customer models. I've learned that the entity component is far more philosophical and important in Viper. An interactor could be talking to various entity components, so it's not just one, it could be like various different repositories. So um, there'll be entities on that side of the equation, but also when, that, when it has retrieved those entities and saw them in particular order, it has to then talk to the presenter. Now, it would be pretty awkward if we just expose those entities directly to the presenter because that means you're exposing underlying you know, implementation. So the interactor will probably process those into its own little entities. There might be little simple structs or whatever. And the presenter will carry on the same pattern. The presenter goes, all right, uh, it's time to show something in my view. I'm not gonna pass in this whole list of invoices or whatever I just retrieved. I'll just strip out all the information that's relevant and it just hands it on to the view. So I guess what's um, the main takeaway is that all communication between components and Viper works with a uh, mechanism of filtering and mapping information from entity to entity. This ensures that the implementation details never leak throughout the entire hierarchy. So now we've kind of done like a round robin. We've started with the view, gone through the presenter, the interactor. We know that we're working with entities of sorts. And eventually we notify things and we go back to the view. Now, what, are, what if we're done with the screen? Like we, we, we've shown our form, we may have saved something, right? We'll hit the, hit the save button, we've shown a loader, it's finished, it says great, done. How do we navigate away? Like who's gonna be responsible for that? So this is where the router finally comes in. Let's say the, the view is considering, um, let's say the view is considered the presentation delegate of the presenter, then the router is considered the navigation delegate of the presenter. The router is concerned with being instructed uh, that a presentation or a dismissal needs to happen, and also the information that it needs to make that happen. So as I mentioned before, there's one problem in MVP, which is the assembly problem, right? The responsibility of who kind of constructs these screens. This is where router, the router really fits in. The router basically tackles the problem by being tasked with instantiating all the components, wiring them together to make sure that all these relationships are in place, and then take on the responsibility of presenting that on the view hierarchy. What that means is that um, the router also has to handle the dependency injection side of things because if we're creating a view which needs a presenter and a presenter which needs an interactor, the interactor needs all the entity things that it's talking to, it is the router that has this knowledge of, all right, if I instantiate all these, this is how I fill them up. This is how I dependency inject all their uh, parameters in. And ultimately you then have a stack. And that stack kind of lives from the view controller up. So the view controller holds on to one, the presenter holds on to the interactor, interactor holds on to the services, and then the view eventually, or the view controller gets loaded on the view hierarchy. Now, because we have given the router the responsibility of instantiating an entire screen, it means that it's also responsible to navigate from screen to screen. 
which, is, which comes back to it being told navigation instructions. So at the presenter layer, something has happened. We've saved something. We know that we're finished. We can then say to the router, hey, router, please navigate to such and so screen. Now, Viper has a lot of good intentions behind it, um, and they become more apparent the deeper you really get into it. Um, it's incredibly modular. It allows you to develop uh, components uh, in unison, right? Uh, moreover, it's very scalable because you can easily construct uh, a new Viper module uh, to add in, to kind of slot it in as a new screen. And with all the Viper components defined with uh, clear inputs and outputs, similar to MVP, it's possible to test each individual component. Um, you can also uh, stub or mock the components on either end of the spectrum uh, to do end-to-end -end subcutaneous testing. It's very flexible. Um, all this modularity translates really well in team environments um, where other teams may need to kind of bootstrap, bootstrap screens that have already been built. There's a very clear interface on who has the responsibility of the presentation of the screens. You just instantiate a router, it makes a screen appear and all the magic is handled for you. Um, with the navigation logic clearly defined, this is just way too easy. And like I said before, the PINC injection is also highly encouraged in this architecture uh, and that is really beneficial for testability. Um, now that we've got the assembly problem solved, um, yeah, Viper solves exactly where the dependency injection knowledge lives. It's in the router, which means that only your router layer has knowledge of your dependency injection um, implementation, which means that can never leak through the hierarchy of your ar architecture either. Now, on the flip side, Viper brings about a lot of boilerplate code. I mean, every new module needs components and all the relationships between them, so you're doing a lot of writing of interfaces. Uh, there are some solutions out there that kind of help you generate these um, code classes for you, like Generamba, but again, that requires a bit of setup and a bit of workflow change. As a consequence, Viper is kind of overkill for small projects. Like, if you're doing a hackathon, do not do Viper. Um, it's kind of like taking a bazooka to a knife fight, which admittedly sounds pretty awesome. Um, there's a lot of mapping that goes on between Viper layers, like I mentioned before, um, as you go from, from component to component. Uh, there's a mapping that goes on to make sure that anything in here is not exposed. There's even a mapping that goes on over here. The format between these two and those ones, and those ones are all different. So you end up with lots of little intermediary entities. Furthermore, you're forcing an architecture on iOS. So, uh, yeah, it, iOS is inherently MVC-ish. It's got a very particular way of doing things. So if you've got like niceties, like storyboards, um, Viper is really going to make it difficult to work with those. Um, lastly, Viper has a steep learning curve, and the material out there is quite ambiguous. Uh, the router, for example, is one of those things that's been considered um, very mysterious because a proper definition was never really provided. Um, and just in general, Viper doesn't really have many examples out there on how to implement on a very large scale. But there are still some Vipers in the world. Um, th there's this app out there, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called Uber. They, apparently they drive you around and shit. Yeah, right. Um, so they looked at Viper and they were like, this is pretty exciting, but I think we're going to put our own spin on it. So what they've done was, they, they called it the RIBS architecture, which basically means uh, router, interactor, and builder. They looked at the router and said, all right, the router is doing the navigation and it's also solving the assembly problem. It does sound like two responsibilities. So they kind of pulled that aside. So the builder is now responsible for creating these, um, these modules. They also said, well, hey, um, if the router can handle navigation, right, and you know, presenting stuff, can it also handle the embedding of view controllers within view controllers and that sort of thing? Can we just start composing screens? So they basically use it to construct this big hierarchy of uh, routers embedded in other routers. They also wanted to change the way that the information um, flows in the hierarchy. So we know with Viper, a view talks to the presenter and back. That talks to an interactor and back. Um, that, that, that's very much like a two-way street. So they were more focused on, all right, instead the view is going to talk to the interactor. Something will happen, eventually that affects the presenter, and that information comes back. So there's no need to kind of go through both channels, so it's kind of a unidirectional flow. Uh, us two, don't know if you've heard of them, they make Monument Valley. They want to do a bit of investigation with Viper, so they decided to build, um, uh, I think it was a video recording framework. And it was a real test for them to actually try and apply this Viper architecture to, yeah, literally a framework. It turns out that the router component becomes kind of pointless, so they ended up omitting that completely, so they're kind of viping, yeah, rather than vipering. Clean Swift is a variety of Viper that's a little bit close to Uber, but still quite true to Viper itself. There's a guy called Raymond Law, he's running a whole bunch of learning resources online, and he calls his the VIP architecture, which is basically Viper, except the order of conversation is similar to how Uber is doing it. Um, myself, I've got three 
big apps out there on the App Store and a few small ones. Um, KiwiBank was the first uh, exposure that I had to the Viper architecture. It was initially built in MVP, and we kind of expanded on, uh, extended on that. Uh, the Realme app is a identity verification app. So basically, imagine you want to apply for a bank account, but you didn't want to actually physically go into the bank. This app would allow you to do a test. You hold your phone up, you look at your camera, and it says, shake your head. And that was called a liveness test. It's to get people that were wearing like cut-ups of other people's faces and make sure we don't catch them, you know, or that they don't, they aren't able to apply for your bank account. We learned very quickly that trying to integrate an entire camera rendering pipeline into the Viper architecture was a bad idea. And um, when we worked on Holo, which was the augmented reality app for iOS, um, we learned from those lessons. So we kept a rendering pipeline separate that was communicated with as well as a Viper stack on the other side. There is no necessarily limit on how much you can Viper things. If you had like a little view that sits at the bottom of your table view, that thing itself could be a Viper stack if you really want to. You can go as deep as you want. I found that a, a good um, guideline is to go by screen by screen. So I've got a bit of uh, parting advice. Um, use protocol oriented programming everywhere. I think Swift is a really elegant language to implement Viper with. I've tried it in Objective-C. It gets very wordy and verbose. Um, using Swift, uh, it's a really elegant language for it. Putting protocols everywhere means that at any moment in time, you can just create a mock or a stub for anything, anything. That's it though. Um, I'd probably say that my presenter and interactor tend to be just concrete classes because you always have those set up as is. The concept of entities I found a little bit vague and I alluded to that earlier. I, I like to think of it more as like a, a services layer. There's a whole bunch of services and they could be a storage service, a network service, repositories, whatever you name it. And that's what the interactor is really communicating with. Interactors talk to services and any of the services can do all sorts of stuff and some of them are concerned with entities. I see more the entity as like the method of communication between all the elements. Routers are likely singletons. Again, I've done various implementations. Um, you can instantiate a router and it holds onto the next router and that's how you create a chain. The problem with that is if each router is holding onto each other but the view controllers are on the hierarchy, like who's holding the reference to who? So I found that taking a singleton approach, allowing these routers to stay alive but inside themselves as weak um, navigation delegates is a good way to get screens um, presenting and dismissing without retaining objects by accident. And like I alluded before, um, weak references uh, I'm using a lot of delegate patterns here. So a presenter would have a delegate outlet for uh, the presentation delegate as well as the navigation delegate, which would be obviously um, the view and the router. Hence why I come up with naming conventions like this is the presentation delegate as opposed to saying this is the view. Um, again, calling something a view when it's not really a view is also really confusing. And you'll find different naming conventions depending on which implementation of Viper that you're looking at. Storyboards are really tricky because they you kind of have to override the initializer whenever you create one of these custom objects. So your view controller needs a custom initializer and then you kind of forego that niceness. You can make them work in tandem, but you still got to go kind of iOS-y. Um, if you work with storyboards, you can pretty much forego your router and just have the view controller handle the, the calling of the segues and that sort of thing. I've got three frameworks that I really like using and I think they integrate well. Uh, Swinject is really awesome for dependency injection. Um, it's a nice way to kind of take some of that responsibility of um, the assembly problem and having it in your dependency injection container. So I, I highly recommend Swinject. Now the conversation between uh, the presenter and the interactor, I said that was an asynchronous kind of conversation. That's a good way if you like using promises or promise kit. Uh, that, that's probably the slice where I put that. And I'd still use a delegate pattern between the presenter and the view. Um, one thing about um, this conversation between the presenter and the viewer is there's a lot of information that needs to be relayed. For example, if there's like a form for invoices and that sort of thing, all those little bits of data, you probably want to assemble that in some sort of a, a sections and rows or sections and items, whatever you want to call it, something that is abstract but could be mapped onto a table view or a collection view. Uh, I found that using differentiator um, is a really good framework to be able to figure out the differential operations. The reason for that is um, entities live quite far on the other side of the Viper um, architecture. So if things change, like say you're working with core data, for example, and objects have updated, you've got inserts and deletes and that sort of stuff, to try and move that information all the way back to the view layer is quite dif difficult. So using a differential calculator kind of eliminates that need to transfer that information across the entire hierarchy. So um, should you Viper? Um, I personally think so. Um, I found that programming in Viper has made me a more uh, honest and disciplined programmer. 
Uh, I might not always write tests, but I architecture, uh, architect my code in such a way that I could, if you know, uh, budgets um, allow. And I architecture my code in such a way that I continue to apply the solid principles and kind of the clean architecture, which is what Viper is mostly based on. Um, I think it's flexible enough that you can start with uh, MVP and then kind of extend into Viper as you need it. So uh, yeah, I hope that you guys will take some um, inspiration from this and ideally go on this journey as well that I've been on because I find it a very rewarding thing. So um, the best way to learn Viper, really get your hands dirty. Start with the basics of MVP and then expand it on, expand on that to create Viper. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.